Once again, good morning and good afternoon to everyone tuning in. And welcome to our webinar today, where our goal in this session is to introduce you to people and ideas that can help you improve the engagement and efficiency of your business to customer communication. I'm Joel from E27, and this is Change the Way You Communicate. So we will be launching a poll on your screen to get to help us get a sense of where you're coming from, and we would like to invite everyone to share your thoughts with us. Okay. So the first question is, is improving customer experience a key focus in your company? So I know, you know, in, in every company, you have different focuses and key areas that you need to prioritize for every year. But we just want to make sure, all, we just want to check if this is one thing, you know, of a key focus for your company for this year or in the next coming years. The next is, have you incorporated any communication channels to your business to improve your operations? You know, I think this is the one of the most challenging things because especially in the digital age, right? There's a lot of things that we can incorporate. But you know, having something that can that you can incorporate to improve your communication channels is something really you know something different. I would say, uh, yeah. So we will be giving this a few more seconds uh, before we close the poll. But it looks like there are a lot of people actually who are planning that their key focus is customer experience, and some of them have incorporated any communication channels as well. Some of them have not yet. And I'll be closing the poll in three, two, one. There you go. Let me share the screen here so you, you can also get a sense of where we're coming, where the other audience are coming from. Yeah, so there are 89% that said yes. Customer experience is their key focus in their company. And for the second question, we, I think we have a neck-to-neck uh, answer here. So have you incorporated any communication channel? Yes. And some are saying like, no, but we are planning to do so anytime soon. Once again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with that. And with all of that out of the way, I would like to turn over the floor to our moderator, Jean. So Jean is a yogi and a firm believer that the future is a symbiotic marriage of spirituality and technology. Her 17-year leadership tenure in Silicon Valley tech space and 12 years in ancient spiritual studies took her to speak at global tech conferences and mentoring in Ivy League universities, one of which is at a Berkeley-based AI fintech startup, which led her to found her own spirit tech company to marry spirituality and conversational AI as a way to help people upgrade their quality of life. So please, help me in welcoming our moderator for today, the founder and head of product of In Silence AI, Ms. Jean Alfonso de Sena. Hi, Jean. Hi, Joel. Hi, everybody. I am so honored to be here, and I'm so excited to, to hear the thoughts of the, the audience and just get this conversation going. Um, what are we going to talk about today? Um, in, in basic words, I, I am so excited to just open the conversation as to what is customer experience to begin with? You know, there's such a big um, discussion about that for, for a long time now, but what really is that and how are emerging channels or innovative technologies helping pave the way to a higher level customer experience, right? And with us today are three fantastic thought leaders that I am so honored to introduce to all of you, beginning with the Asia Pacific Head of Client Management for Business Messaging at Meta, Adam Bowden. Hi, Jean. Thank you. And thank you for the welcome. Great. Good to see you. Um, our next um, panelist is the CEO and co-founder at Curious Thing, Sam Zeng. Hi, Jean. Thank you. Thank you for the welcome. Sam. And our third panelist for today is the head of solutions at Curious Thing, Rick Johnson. Hi, Jean. Hi, everyone. Very excited for this conversation today. So wonderful. I am delighted to be here. Um, it's not every day that I get to hang out with, <laughs> with fellow conversational AI, emerging technologies, big technology leaders who, who understand the language of, of just that conversation, especially in this day and age where, you know, where it feels like the world is just coming out of like uh, some sort of sleep, you know, coming from the pandemic, um, the world closing down, and now people and companies and technologies are kind of starting to reemerge and introducing new new ways of communicating with their audience, with their with their customers. 
But before we start with the actual panel, I'm curious, Sam, Adam, and Rick, what is your definition of customer experience? Even, be, even before we talk about what cool technologies we have helped build in the last two to three years, right? And maybe Adam can start. Great, always like to be the first one. Um, thank you, Gene. I guess for, for me and a little bit more broadly as, as a business and meta, we're, we look at customer experiences, being able to give customers a seamless experience being able to engage with them at all aspects of a customer journey, whether that's discovery, marketing, lead generation, transacting, uh, even customer care. I think the it's a great deal of importance now to have that one seamless experience and to also provide that experience where the customers are and not where businesses expect customers to be. What a wonderful way of describing that. Is, uh, I think in, in this point in 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 life, there's um, there's a lot of confusion about how how to really communicate and stay engaged, um, you know, in in many aspects and points of a product life cycle or a service. So that's beautiful, beautifully said, Adam. Rick, would you like to go? Sure. Um, I don't have as polished an answer as that, but I completely agree with the the seamless nature of it. I think customer experience is this inherently personal expectation that each of us has. And that's part of the challenge that we have in this communication space is, you know, the, we, we plan for how to make it seamless and how to make it easy and how to meet people where they want to operate. But that doesn't mean that everybody still wants to have the same experience. You know, there, there has to be options and channels and um, variety there for people who want to interact in different ways. So, um, yeah, I, I don't have a, a more, more refined answer than that, other than it's a very personal relationship with a business. Oh, that's that's awesome. I think personal was the key word there, Rick. Um, it's in in the gazillion options of messaging and ways to connect with customers, you know, which one and what is what is actually the best? There's there's no best. It has to really be personal, but but going through the motions of actually choosing is hard. So I'm excited. I'm excited to know more about your thoughts on that. Sam, what is customer experience for you? Um, to me, I think, you know, when we think about like customer experience, uh, you know, in terms of like a delivery, what we promised, uh, it's more around deliver the what and how um, with the right timely manner. Um, so I think these three components, as long as you deliver that, you know, correctly, I think customer would be satisfied. But beyond that, I think the key thing we realized when we enable lots of business doing um, you know, intelligent customer experience is more around the trust. So, you know, as soon as you build trust, actually you can deliver the what and how and also with the right timing even better. And actually you can even invite customers to rethink and reimagine what is the what and how and what is the better timing. So that's kind of my view towards what is good customer experience. Oh, that's exciting. The delivery and because in, in, in one way, there's, you know, someone could be doing a great thing, connecting and engaging their customers, but the product is forgotten along the way. There's so much chatting and conversation, but where's the product and how is it, you know, solving the, the real problems? Uh, on another hand, it could be that there's a great product or service, but there's no way to just bring it to the customers and um, just get them to to stay connected with that product and service. So I love how it's so diverse how the three of you um, you know shared your own personal definitions of customer experience. So how about um, you know just based on your own research and you know the years of experience in working within kind of the engage engaging with customers or conversational AI or messaging. What is the landscape looking like right now? Where do customers really want to be when it comes to connecting with the businesses? And anyone can go and, and address that. I'm happy to go first because it leaves me more to talk about. <laughs> um, so I guess kind of the way we're, we're looking at it at the moment, um, if you think kind of the way that people communicate with businesses is changing. And that's only been accelerated um, because of the pandemic. 
around the world now, people are messaging businesses of all sizes, not just enterprises, but SMBs to little, you know, one-stop, um, cake-making, independent um, people. So that communication is happening. Um, and it's for a whole variety of different reasons. So whether it is to get help in information, make a purchase, could it be to get a um, you know, bank balance update from, from your bank or make a hotel reservation? There's a variety of different reasons like, that people want to engage. And they want to do it in the same way that they chat and communicate with their friends and family. Because now they want the businesses to come to them and where they're communicating rather than the expectation of them to go and find and source the businesses that they want to engage with and then start the conversation. I'd agree with that, Adam. I think it's um, it's really interesting. You know, it used to be a case of um, you know, businesses were trying to get on the front foot and have proactive communication with their customers. You know, make it really easy for them and reduce the customer effort. And it's becoming less about that and more about convenience. You know, I don't, I don't know about everybody else, but I feel like going through the pandemic, I'm not commuting anymore. I should have more time on my hands. Somehow, I have significantly less time on my hands, and so that you know, for it to be convenient to call a customer service channel during the day, it's worse when I'm at home I, I don't fit around business hours business hours don't exist anymore business channels a lot of the time are looking very different like you're saying Adam so I think it's less about you know it's no longer about necessarily proactivity or pre um, preemptive service it's about convenience and um, that's where that customer expectation feels like it's changing for me Sam yeah well I, I don't like you know talking kind of like after you guys because I think lots of points I really want to raise is already covered maybe I'll, I'll start from a different angle so I think uh, in the past when businesses are thinking about like touch points they think about key customer milestone like uh, you know the customer recently started with us or the customer is churning or this is anniversary but today especially thanks to lots of technology companies um, you know the touch points definitely are massively changing. Today, I think most of the businesses are required to actually create touch points in a more intelligent and smarter way. And also in the way that you need to be kind of like being proactive, also be very, very responsive at the same time. So I think this is the basically the trend we have seen in lots of, uh, especially B2C businesses. Um, so it's the challenge. Also, it's a great opportunity for large organizations like Meta and small organizations like Curious Thing. Um, I can see that Adam has something to add. So I think you, you made a great point, which I wanted to just follow up on, which is around the touch points. Um, we don't have independent touch points with customers. You do not have one single touch point for customer care, for sales, for product information, for um, discovery. A customer chooses their own stage of the journey and none of those are in isolation. So a customer who is wanting to speak to a business with a support issue is just as likely to be somebody that the business wants to speak to about a new sales opportunity or to provide information to help them in a future state. I think what businesses are starting to understand is that you cannot segment those touch points across different departments and different channels. You need to bring that conversation into one place. Um, so that's just creating a little bit more complexity for organizations to, to understand. But from a customer experience standpoint, it does improve that significantly. And we've seen, for example, across Meta, a 50% increase in conversations just over the last year because a lot of these businesses are now starting to understand and realize that we can engage at multiple different touch points, but not have those as isolated or independent touch points. I love how all of you gave many aspects of the landscape and the experience and the behavior, the current behavior that's changing of customers. In effect, the three of you put out like a holistic way of looking at the customer experience and what they need and want and what they've been asking for and actually doing and, and how, you know, Meta and Curious Thing are trying to address that changing need. And so with that, I'd like to insert right away because I, I so love messaging and conversations and WhatsApp is my favorite uh, messaging app without bias and, and conversational AI is just really close to my heart. So I would like to just open up the conversation on that. What is, what is Curious Thing 
you know, trying to to deliver to businesses, and at the same time, how are how is that helping customers kind of experience a, a new way of conversing with businesses? And later on, I'm curious for Adam to share what maybe what's new in WhatsApp and the other channels that Facebook or Meta is um, either building already or or just putting out later on to to both the business and the customer side of things. Sam first. Uh, I'll, I'll go first this time. Sorry, Rick uh, and Adam. So I, I think I, this is a very good question. Maybe I'll just continue with the topic we just discussed regarding the, um, the, the customer touch points. So uh, to be specific, curious thing, we only focus on, on one problem, which is like how to use voice AI to actually have a conversation with customers, especially proactive conversations. So uh, my background is uh, many years ago, I was working in insurance. Uh, I was a statistician. And um, back then, every time there is a flood or event happening uh, in a certain area, no matter which team you are in, you have to go to call center and call customers or wait for the customers to call you. It's just the reality of the insurance. People still do that today. Of course, with the help of a new digital channel, things are getting better. But trust me, when there is a cyclone, no matter which team you are in, you could be a claim officer, you still need to go to call center to answer these phone calls on the second day. So really what we offer or where we think voice AI can really help is, you know, just think about the timing and I think about the kind of like the order differently. Uh, if there's an event happening this afternoon, just call everyone in the evening, tell them there are three ways you can help them and check in with them and see whether you are um, they are happy or they are feeling safe. The important thing, I think, to go back to the touch point thing is we are reinventing how touch points are created. Even before people realize that, okay, I need to talk to someone, you talk to them first. So that's basically where we think voice AI can really help. So in the end, you know, the 2% or 1% people who really need some human help they can be fast tracked into this human help situation. So that's kind of like the, the key thing I'm trying to share, which is voice AI, conversational AI, you know, it should be designed to enable the mass communication, being proactive, and then importantly, get real time feedback uh, from, the, from the conversation. Rick, Adam. I might add to that um, just to give a bit of context background. Um, so my background is much less glamorous than Sam's. I came from the world of call centers uh, and I was a customer of Curious Thing um, because they saved my bacon. You know, we had this, this day at the start of the pandemic where we actually needed to do something which was going to be physically impossible with humans was we needed to call 200,000 people in a day. Um, and you can't do it with people. You know, we, we couldn't conjure them out of thin air. So, you know, how could we get a critical message out to people, just like Sam's talking about, within an eight-hour span to find out who needed help and, you know, how could we best then support them with the humans we did have? Find those needles in the haystack and bring them back in to give them the support where, it's mo where it most matters. Um, so obviously, you know, as a customer then, it, it, was a, it was a stressful day, but we all got through it together. But it really showed me how AI, you know, Sometimes we think about it as going to solve this commoditized problem, you know, give AI the work that the humans don't want to do, but it's actually finding ways to get the humans to the work that they do want to do. Um, and clearly I liked the, the technology so much that I'm now working on this side of it, trying to solve business problems. But um, I don't know, Adam, do you feel, feel much the same about you know, the sorts of problems that it's coming into play to solve? Well, fortunately, I've never had to solve trying to call 200,000 uh, people in, in one day. Um, I guess when I kind of look at the, the landscape now and I break it into three areas from a, a meta perspective, ultimately to, to go back to the point earlier, I mentioned about that, that seamless experience. When we look at our, our products, it is about being able to provide something where if I am raising a complaint to a business on Messenger um, and then that same business messages me on WhatsApp about some product that they think I might be interested in, I want those two conversations to be known by the company. I don't want those to feel like they're two independent conversations. So definitely for us, it's looking at every stage of the, the customer experience, uh, where and how do we bring that to a seamless experience? 
but also understanding that not every person wants the same type of experience. Um, and I often use the same example where if somebody has a, a, an issue and they want to kind of speak to somebody to solve that issue, it's amazing how many of those issues can actually be solved by a chatbot. And even though we might say, no, I want to speak to a person, we actually don't. We want the most efficient and quickest way for me to solve the problem. And if I can have an interaction with a chatbot and solve that problem in five minutes, I'm happier than being on the phone waiting for an hour to speak to an agent. But that's not going to be the same for everybody. So if I can't solve through a bot, can I solve through a chat or conversation interaction with an actual human being? Because again, that can scale much quicker. If I can't solve through there, how do I then get directed to somebody that I actually can have that conversation? And that entire experience is known rather than get to the person at the end and you feel like you need to explain the last 10 minutes of what you've been doing. So, you know, kind of that's the ultimate experience that we want to provide to people. Um, and just the ability to scale. Um, I can talk about it later. We've got, you know, an example is a, a, a bank in Indonesia where they're actually having about 10,000 interactions on WhatsApp a day. You cannot do that scale via a call center, um, but you can do it and provide that seamless experience. And I think one of the questions that someone asked is, how do you provide the personalized experience when everyone's personal expectations are different? And I think that is really trying to understand your customers, learning what they are and are not um, interested in. So one of the things that we put a lot of emphasis on is, is quality and control in the hand of the users. I think everyone who has used WhatsApp will know that if you get a message that you're not expecting, you do have the ability to report or block that. Now that actually empowers you as a consumer to make sure you're only hearing from the people you want to hear about. And for the businesses, we put a lot of emphasis on them to focus on three key things, relevancy, timely, and expectancy. And if you are not delivering across those three, you'll often provide a poor customer experience. That is so um, fantastic. Yes, yeah, so I, I think Adam raised a really, sorry, a few things to add from my side. I think Adam raised a really, really good point regarding the variety of the, you know, different types of touch points. And sometimes people just want to basically do, do this through chat, maybe WhatsApp, um, maybe short message, or maybe a, you know, online chat bot. You know, we sell voice AI, but we also use other channel like, Every time before the AI calling people, actually our AI will send a short message. Maybe in the future, we can also use WhatsApp to tell people, hey, I'm Helen, the AI. I will call you in 30 minutes from this organization just to let you know the phone call is going to happen. Don't go to your basement um, to basically build the initial trust. I think you know the points regarding how do you actually build the trust with the individuals so they know it's in their control. Uh, during the conversation, they know that they can speak to human if they want to, or they can stop the conversation anytime if they want to. That's very, very important. I think that's the thing for all the, I would say, communication channel providers to learn, which is how do we actually enable the trust and the, turn the trust into basically a good customer to business relationship. Yes, 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 for sure. I was, I was going to say, Rick, uh, call center, customer, la customer center life, never a boring place to be. <laughs> I came from there also for a long time. Um, and Adam, I love how you know the way you delivered the the meta effort in communicating and changing the ways that businesses are communicating with their customers. I love how you showed that you know it's never, it's never pushing one app or never pushing a certain way of communicating. I love how you open it up and you actually empower the customers to choose and you know give or make your services accessible at whatever time or day um, the customers are, are wanting and needing to talk to the business. And Sam, uh, yeah, there's a big push on trust, you know, especially in businesses in Japan, that's such a huge thing. And now because we're you know we're using and building voice ai very nascent space and ai even if it's been around for six decades it's still new to a lot of businesses and customers and adam on the side of meta whatsapp has been around but because there's again there's a gazillion other options how do we get both the people the customers and the businesses to to even give us give us a try because it's not easy it's not easy to either shift from one messaging app to another 
or incorporate int integrate something new such as voice AI. So Sam, maybe you can go next. Absolutely, because I think, um, you know, because um, I, I also saw there is a there is a question from the audience regarding the privacy and, uh, you know, data protection. I think these two conversations are very, very linked, so I will basically address them together. I think, um, of course, when people work with a large organization like Meta or Microsoft, I think this concern will be lower um, but for smaller organization it would be like always oh, the data stored they are, they are high level information or how is the data processed who owns the data etc cetera, etc cetera. that's why very early on though it took us a long time we actually get the full you know say iso 2701 certificate gdpr compliance etc cetera, etc cetera. but that's just a step one i think the step two is like really what is the best way to address the scam concern Right, like no matter which channel you are using today, you know the, the concern regarding scam is is real. Uh, what I hear, I could be wrong, is it's particularly bad in Singapore. <laughs> um, so you receive a lot of phone calls saying, "Hey, you owe the money," or "Hey, your Amazon delivery, uh, you know, is late. Please put in your number or whatever." Um, so I think the key thing is basically how do you use technology plus user experience. We call it conversational user experience to address it. It's not just one technology issue. It's also a behavior and a user experience issue. For example, from our side, like I said, firstly, we never do cold calling. Uh, our AI only do calling when the business knows the customer and they know the customer's name. The AI will address the name. Secondly, we'll start with saying, hey, we don't collect any personal information just for this particular you know, purpose. And importantly, we also use other technology kind of like, you know, side of the protection, for example, the phone number will be masked as the company name instead of a naked phone number, et cetera, et cetera. All of these together will reduce the concern. I'm not saying it will remove the concern because concern is always there regard, regardless if it's human or AI. But what I want to say is like, it's a journey. And, you know, I, I think when WhatsApp business was introduced a few years ago, I'm pretty sure Meta went through a similar journey, which is how do we actually ensure that, you know, customers feel it's the right thing and they feel they are in control. And we are for this new category of voice AI, we are going through the same journey. We are also learning from the other players in the market to see what we can do to address this particular problem. But it's a real problem. And you know, the category itself, us, we have to, we have to solve it. Awesome, awesome. Adam, how, how is it like in Meta? Uh, I was just going to touch on Sam's point about some of the scams in, in, in Singapore. Being based in Singapore, I do get, you know, daily phone calls, which are about something that I've, I'm definitely not a part of or an SMS. And I know a lot of the, the banks have actually kind of take an approach where they just will not include any links within any of their SMSs now, just because of the, the fear around the association with that. So I actually get proactive messages telling me I will not get messages with links in them. So um, they're definitely trying to be on the front foot. I would probably take this in, in two, two parts. The first is from, and I'll take WhatsApp as an example. Um, you know, the, the research shows now that, that seven in 10 people are more comfortable to actually be connected and engage with businesses. Um, and 65% of those people actually say they prefer to message with those businesses as opposed to other forms of channels. So there is a genuine customer desire to do that. And to put a bit of a scale to it, we have about 1 billion people who are messaging businesses every week across the Meta platform. So that tells you the vast majority of the people are comfortable with that type of engagement. From the businesses side, they really need to make sure they have a great understanding of their customers. Customer segmentation is becoming far more sophisticated, not just an active or an inactive customer, but what's the definition of active and where are they active and what are they active doing? And if they are inactive, why are they inactive? Are they someone that comes on and doesn't complete something? Are they somebody that gets three quarters of the way through it and drop out? So really understanding your customers allows you to better tailor 
what seems to be a very personalized experience, even if it's a personalized experience at scale. Um, and I always use the example, if I've gone on and I've tried to purchase from an e-commerce platform, a, an iron, an ironing board, a hoover, and you know, a washing machine, it's suggesting I might be in the process of maybe moving into a new house or completely redoing all of my uh, kind of household utensils, et cetera. So if I've gone in and I've purchased three of those items, but dropped out, there's a reason why I've dropped out of purchasing the first, the fourth item. Maybe I got a price somewhere better elsewhere. Maybe that one wasn't available for delivery at the same date as the other three. And I want convenience, but that's going to tell them a lot. And if they're starting to retarget information back to me, they need to be able to use that insight to be able to come back to me and engage as opposed to send me some advertising about a new sofa within my house because maybe I haven't even tried to buy that through them or I don't see them as a, as a seller of that product. Um, so I think that's kind of key. And then kind of the final one from a, I guess, a trust and, and, and a safety standpoint, it, WhatsApp is built for users. It was never built for businesses. And what that means is we put the power of the experience within the hands of the users. As I mentioned, you have the ability to report, you have the ability to block. We have so many businesses that would like to do a lot more than what they are, but we need them to go through a journey of building trust through quality before they're able to scale out to the volumes that they want to. Because our users, as in you, I, and everyone else, as a user of WhatsApp, is fundamental to how we build our product for businesses. Fantastic. I think Sam would like to add further to that. Yeah, because I think Adam raised a very uh, good point regarding recommendation system. Because uh, actually, I, you know, before started my, this is my second startup, before starting my first startup, I was a data scientist. I was involved in a very large recommendation system for the largest supermarket in Australia. So, the interesting thing is our recommendation system was based on association, which is like people are more likely to purchase these items together. Maybe there is a kind of like a guesswork. We can suggest they are in a certain persona, say our oh, Adam is moving, Sam is preparing food for his friends, um, you know, uh, getaway, or, you know, oh, this person is married recently. Um, the, the, there's a one interesting thing I heard from a non-tech person. I feel that's the most important thing I learned around the building recommendation system, which is why don't you guys just ask, you know, if you feel, you know, this person might be moving, why don't you just ask? Then back then, I think the key thing was like, how, like, can you really find a way to ask everyone? Uh, but now maybe we have a way, you know, you can use AI to call them, you can basically use programmable short message or WhatsApp to reach out to them and try to collect information to close the loop. Of course, there's a fine line you have to define being nice and collect information, but not like pushing the line of, I want to know you more too much. Um, yeah, that's the additional thing I want to add. Yeah, yeah. I have a very special question for Rick. Um, but before that, um, Sam, you reminded me of my experience a long time ago, the first time I landed in Narita Airport. I was just passing time and I was planning to shop. So I was going through the website and then an AI powered virtual assistant popped up, proactively asked me what was I looking for. And at that time, I wasn't in AI yet. But the experience was seamless. It wasn't unneeded. It wasn't unnecessary. It was actually such a cool way to, to pop up. So I think thinking about you know, the seamless and the trust and the enabling um, effort that you both talked about, I think if, you know, if that kind of experience can always be replicated by businesses through the efforts of Curious Thing and Meta, I think that'll be great. Um, Rick, I've been wanting to ask this. So customer care centers or call centers or BPO, right? Having come from there, there was a there was a period in an era of the call center industry growing, growing so fast in many places in the world, especially from where I came from, the Philippines. Now, one of the things that organizations are coming to me about is how can I how can I bring AI into my company, whether they are they are a call center organization or something else. But at the same time, there's kind of a pushback. And it's hard for me personally to, to put together in simpler language how 
actually either messaging um, services or conversational AI or chatbots can actually empower and bring more ROI or efficiency to, to businesses. So what have you been doing in Curious Thing and what, based on your experience, has been your experience in just shifting, you know, shifting businesses from the typical call center to AI? Fantastic question, Jean. Um, I think what you really hit on there was there's this, this third stakeholder. Like in, in every conversation that we're having between an organization and a customer where there is a call center team, the call center agents and how they feel about any of the technology that they are working with is really critical. You know, are we doing something that actually empowers them and allows them to do their job in a more meaningful way or in a lower effort way or in a more efficient way or feel like they're able to create better customer value because that's the thing that they, they're passionate about. On the other end, you know, the first people we think about is the, the customer side of things. So is the AI doing something that's actually of value to the customer? So like Sam touched on before, don't do cold sales with AI. Don't reach out in a meaningless way. You know, I think Adam mentioned before how many different channels and relationships we've got with businesses and brands and, and our families and friends across all these different channels. Don't reach out unless you need to. Don't try and be all that, hey, I hope you're having a great day with that brand relationship. People have other means for that. Um, but then it also has to be a value for the business. So how do you make sure there's really great return on investment? And so what we're seeing when we're going through and planning how we tackle these problems with um, our call centre partners is what are those conversations that are of value to the business and of value to the customer and are going to make life easier for the call centre teams? And a lot of the time it comes down to things like um, accessibility. So coming back to what I was talking about before with the, the hours of operation and when is a good time for people to speak, um, one of the things that AI is really good at is, you know, we can call people out, we'll send them an SMS and say, don't go to your basement. And then they do, or they're working or they get a phone call and they can't have the conversation there and then, particularly in financial services and particularly in debt management and payment collections. What we're seeing is this really interesting pattern of 20 to 30 minutes after they've missed the phone call, they'll call us back. And the AI can have the conversation then, but the person knows what the call is about. It's on their terms. They're ready to have the discussion and they just want to get it solved. Um, but if you were to call back through to a call center, who are you? What are you calling about? Go through the IVR. You've got to wait in those queues or it might be two in the morning. You know, I think a lot of the, the accessibility piece and extending the reach of the call center and having us know who that person is and what it is that they needed to achieve. That's been one of the easiest starting points for us. Um, and just before I throw over to Adam, I just wanted to make a quick comment on segmentation um, that you're talking about before, because I think that's incredibly powerful for businesses and how they provide great service for people. When it comes to voice AI, the cautionary thing is don't assume you know who's going to like it. So we've been speaking to people from different demographics, particularly different age groups um, over the last 12, 18 months. And it's been probably astonishing to people that customers who are over 60 years old are quite happy to speak to a pleasant robot if the robot will get the job done. So it's all about the outcome and the convenience and being very transparent. I think somebody else asked, do it, does the AI identify, identify itself as an AI? Always, always be upfront. That way people understand the limitations of the channel, how far it should go, what the experience should be like. Um, but yeah, go, go in open-minded because customers will surprise us as to what they're open to if outcome is the thing that matters to them. Sorry, Adam, I'll stop now. No, no, that's great. I mean, it was a very... Uh, a good segue. So it's, when you talk about demographics, everything, the only person that comes to my mind is my, my father. He is as old school as you would get. He communicates to me by phone call and by email. If he, go, if he needs to do anything with his bank, he will refuse to do anything apart from walk into the bank and actually transact in the bank. Um, and that's my dad. And I just cannot get convince him to do anything else. Um, I think one of the things I wanted to, to touch on, I think we've talked a lot about the organizations and I think we've touched on the customers and I saw it came up as a question as well. So like the key thing to understand is this, this shift in channels, it's driven by customers. So as this is not about businesses trying to move customers to where they want them to be. This is now about businesses shifting to where customers expect them to be. So it is really important that we, we think about messaging as conversations. The more you can have conversations with people and easy conversations, the more you can understand. And to Sam's point, why don't we just ask them what they want to hear about from us? Well, you know, does someone want to have a phone call and go through a questionnaire about that? No. If someone gets an email, are they going to complete it? Maybe, maybe not. Or they might just unsubscribe. 
if they get a message say hey we thought you might be interested in this are you yes or no you click hit no okay that's one data point we can take back we can learn over a period of time um you're not going to send them 25 different options but the shift is coming from customers it's where they want to be the importance of understanding and learning about your customers is is imperative and if you look at you know banks as one particular uh, organization somebody who might want to get you know bank balance updates or credit card statements through messaging might not want to use messaging if they have a lost credit card they might want to feel like they can immediately speak to somebody so it doesn't mean that all interactions and this is where we talk about the whole customer journey they are not isolated now so understanding at which areas people feel more comfortable to have a different channel and bringing that holistic experience to those customers is going to get better results than just feeling like messaging or conversations is the only channel or ai is the only channel that's so wonderful and so true it's um again in this day and age there's just so many options and so many conversations going and so many trust issues so it is um it's such a delight and it's so reassuring to to hear the efforts of both curious thing and meta as far as really enabling the customers to to choose what method format they want to communicate with businesses at the same time you know providing options also to businesses and how they would like to connect and stay connected with their with their customers and you know maybe for call centers also how to shift into that new age of talking and and taking care of customers um, I think we're ready to open the floor to um, to questions from the participants from the audience. Um, so let's see what questions we have. Um, so yeah, Lilette asked a question which I think Sam already addressed about the security and privacy issues. Um, and while we're waiting to see if there are additional questions, um, Sam or Rick, maybe you'd like to add to that because here in Japan, trust is a huge thing. There's it, people never get tired of talking about it, and you know, just going through the uh, you know the motions of digital transformation. Um, you know, it's there's there's a, there's a lot of opportunity to to just educate some more. Um, and I'm just looking at questions now. One of the questions from the uh, audience is how do we check and balance the seamless experience of customer experience since it's something personal and every person has different standards in how they want to be supported. So this is from an anonymous viewer. And I can. I'll have a crack at that one. Um, I think that, you know, we touched a little bit about having a right channel and channel of choice and asking people and letting them um, sort of direct their own journey. So if you prefer not to be in this channel, how do you get to where you want to be? From a voice AI perspective, one of the ways that we, we check um, is we ask customers at the conclusion of their call, a lot of the time, how did you find this? You know, did it, did it meet your expectations? And particularly while we're going through the initial setup of, of introducing conversational AI as you know, one of the team members, basically how we want people to think about it. Um, we ask people what they think about it. And the, again, the responses are, are surprisingly positive, um, particularly when you've got it in the right use case. We find that uh, in our health sector, we've found uh, between 75 and 85% of people are very positive about being able to speak with an AI because it's available, they understand what it's there for, and they know they feel supported and connected with the organisation. Uh, in the uh, financial services space, um, we've got some amazing customers who are doing this great job of setting up the AI at the start of the customer journey. So when you're starting to onboard, you're going through your application process, they've introduced the AI to uh, touch base and let people know where they're up to, gather some feedback along the way. And they've set that expectation up so that once that customer is now a live customer, they can then use the AI to reach out to follow up on things, to follow up on late payments, to let them know that a new thing's coming out, to see if they need support. Um, so by asking those questions early on about how do you feel about speaking with an AI about these types of topics, you can quickly learn uh, what's the right sort of thing to be speaking to people about in that particular channel. And then how can you record that in your, in your CRM? So you segment out those who would actually are going to have a different communication preference. Maybe they have a language barrier or maybe they need to communicate um, in, in written form. You know, you've got to learn about that stuff over time. But I think 
asking people what they think as well as observe, observing the way that they interact with the AI. A lot of that, that behaviour teaches us a lot as well. Super cool, super cool. We got six more questions, so I'm just going to plug away. From an anonymous viewer, at which point should you incorporate AI into your customer service? Is it is there a number of um, customers or transactions? How do you know, right? When is a good time for a business to embrace that? Sam or Adam? Sorry, my internet was off for five seconds. Jane, can you please repeat your question? Now I told like AI. Can you please repeat? Yes, yes, yes. That happens to me too. Uh, even in Japan and Singapore. <laughs> At which point should you incorporate AI into your customer service? Is there like a number of customers or transactions or what's a good indicator that the company is ready to embrace AI? Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the key thing from our perspective, uh, you know, because we had a lot of success with some, with some great organizations, especially health and financial services, but also I have to admit, we have got use cases that is not so successful. So we learned from both good side and bad side of using voice AI. And I think um, like what Rick was mentioning, just try to think that having this conversation, especially think, think about this, right? If I send a short message to a customer, customer can choose to ignore it. But if you give them a call, they, if they pick up, you are basically asking them to concentrate on this particular thing for the next five seconds. Then they decide whether they hang up or not. It's actually a higher energy in terms of engagement. So the key thing is basically businesses and us, we need to make sure that this type of a conversation is truly value adding to individuals. On the health side, we do lots of daily check-ins with patients just basically just check, check with them and see whether the symptom is getting better, et cetera, et cetera. Collect consistent feedback, pass it back to the hospital. Patients actually appreciate this. But just imagine if, you know, in another context, you just call people and say, hey, you know, did you want to buy some flour from our convenience store, you know, at the lobby of the hospital? I'm pretty sure people will hate it. We wouldn't be able to achieve 80% engagement rate. But if you send people an email saying, hey, just remember, we also sell these. Maybe people wouldn't mind. So this would link back to Adam's comments. No matter which channel we provide, each of the channels would have pros and cons. It will be good for this and bad for this. I think it's important for businesses and also technology providers to truly firstly acknowledge that. And secondly, you know, be part of your customers and your client's journey to actually say, hey, this is what we are good at and we can help you with this, but we don't help you with that because that's not what this channel is supposed to be. I hope that answers your question. I love it. I love the, uh, the candid answer there. Adam also has a... Go for it. Sure, I, I wasn't gonna to talk too much on the AI. We've got experts around that here, so I'll, I'll leave that to them. I think maybe also linked to one of the questions that somebody asked was, well, like what are some of the challenges that businesses face when they're trying to, to kind of bring in some of these new channels? Um, like you need to look internally and externally. So externally first, you know, what generally are the, the challenges that your, your customers are facing? If you are in a market, you know, I face this a lot across Southeast Asia where, you know, mobile connectivity is genuinely an issue, then should you go with more of a message first approach versus a, um, telephony based approach doesn't mean it's right or wrong but facing that where are your customers spending time um, what are your other kind of macro based challenges in those markets and then internally what we found is that a lot of businesses actually don't necessarily have all of their different systems set up to be connected and I talked about this seamless experience if you have three or four systems one is a sales system one is a customer support system one is a a product-based system and they're not well integrated or connected then again it feels like a very um haphazard approach to engaging with customers so actually making sure that internally your infrastructure is set up the other is you're having to create the right business case um, change is always difficult to, to create and um, particularly if it's changing to something new so you really need to understand the roi and also the biggest recommendation i give and this is why 
most of the businesses that utilize our product actually work with a partner. And the reason they do is because those partners are expert. They're expert of bringing together businesses, technology, our platforms, they're you know, very well equipped at knowing what is good quality, bad quality, best practice. So rather than try and always learn yourself, there are businesses out there that are highly experienced at being able to help customers to go through this journey. So having that self, uh, self-understanding of what you can do and where you do need to bring in experts as well. I say the same thing to organizations. It's it's more than just, you know, bringing in a sophisticated technology. It's really, really helpful if, you know, we, we all educate ourselves as we go through, um, you know, this um, adaptation of, of new technologies. Thank you, Adam. We have a fun question next um, from an, an anonymous viewer. Um, if I ask a voice AI or a chatbot, if they're an AI, would they answer? I think it's a it's a fun question to, to answer. Maybe Rick or Sam. <laughs> well, they should. Um, they should introduce themselves as an AI. You know, I think um, one of the, the design things that we work through with partners very early on is what's the identity? You know, that, that conversational UX that Sam talks about and the brand identity that, that, that you're building for the AI is really important. Um, you know, it's not just the name and the voice, but it's also how does it refer to itself? What's the relationship that it has with the organisation? Um, all of that that exists in the conversation. And absolutely, you know, you can have some fun with how you would have the AI respond to a question like that, but you don't want to get in these service bots. It's very, very different from a home assistant. So you don't want to get caught up in the small talk and the gamified loop. These are purposeful AI conversations. We're trying to achieve something for the customer and the organization. Um, So as much as our technology is super fun and you can do a lot of really cool, um, quirky things with it, um, we tend to guide people not to spend too much time on that, you know, really focus on what those business outcomes are so that people understand that the AI has a job to do um, and the job is there to help the customer. Super fun. My, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to just share my one minute answer to that. Um, if, if the trainer, if the human trainer trains the bot, they would answer, they would tell them. And I'm saying this from experience because I used to train AI machines and I'm like, what do we, what do we train the bot with? And so, um, yeah, it's super fun, super, super fun. We have a lot more questions, so I, and I don't think, unfortunately, we can go through everything. So maybe we can take one more, and then I would like to invite the panelists to share their closing remarks. Um, and then the rest of the questions we can maybe answer. I will, I will let Joel share how, how we can answer that. Um, so the, the last question for today, I, from an anonymous viewer, I love the point where you said that every person has different expectations and how they want to experience the process but the customer landscape changes every day. How do we get ahead of that? How do we anticipate the trend? Do we wait for the customers to voice out their wants or should we dictate that? Adam, do you wanna start? Sure. Um, I know we've maybe touched on it a little bit because I think that was one of the the first questions, but I I think the important thing is, as we talked about, it's it's really understanding your customers. Um, When we talk about being ahead, um, we've seen the the behaviors of trust and customers changed dramatically over the last two years. Now, nobody probably could have got ahead of knowing that a pandemic was going to come. It's more about how do you become agile to be able to shift and evolve very quickly. Um, so I think the focus is more around understanding customer behaviors, having a strategy that aligns to customer behaviors, but building your infrastructure, and I don't necessarily just mean technology infrastructure, but general infrastructure to be agile enough to shift and evolve very, very quickly, because you need to be able to learn at every different touch point. Every interaction with a customer is a learning opportunity. And as long as you learn through every touch point, you will be evolving at a speed that is the same speed as the customer's behavior changes. I think it's quite difficult to get ahead of that, but as long as you are in line with that, you're going to be successful. Yeah, so much emphasis on. Yeah, a very, sorry, sorry, Jane, a very small thing I want to add, um, because I'm pretty sure lots of people would be wondering why these companies having such a weird name. And trust me, this is relevant. Um, So we started with building the system where we think AI should be used, not just for answering the question, but asking the right question to collect information and, you know, derive certain business action. To go back to what Adam is saying, I think, 
really the important matter is be curious about your customers and you know for businesses just to really try to understand what a customer really needs even maybe before they share that with you or ask them open-ended questions um, i think this would actually give you the idea regarding hey this is the part we didn't know if you run coffee shop you might want to know why people don't like your coffee or like your coffee but if you don't ask the question you know people will just give you an nps three out of five four out of five you wouldn't know but maybe it's the temperature maybe it's the change of the coffee bean just ask um, so that's basically where we want to go like you know enable the businesses to be more curious so that you are proactive i love it i love the name let's take one more question from derek fun i hope i'm pronouncing your name correctly the company I work for, which is HubSpot, puts our customer first in all we do. Curious to know if the adoption of emerging channels should be different or the same when it comes to servicing internal and external stakeholders. Anyone can take that. Oh, all right, all right. Um, I, I think it depends on the use case. It's not about the, the customer. It's about the, the um, I think about with the job that's being done. Um, so is, if you want to be speaking to people and gathering information from your internal team members, then, you know, great. Use voice AI to have that conversation. If you want to be checking if your team members are coming to work, send them messages through WhatsApp. You know, it depends on what it is, the job that's, uh, that you're trying to achieve and what's the preferred channel for those people. So what's going to be the most efficient way to get to that outcome? Um, Adam? Uh, yeah, so I was going to say maybe in a simplified way without talking about products, because obviously Meta does have products in this area as well. I think the general understanding is people's behaviors have changed, both outside of work and inside of work, but they're not necessarily the same approach you need to take for, for both. Um, all I'd say is really understand what your needs are internally about how you communicate, how you interact. Um, and again, particularly as we have not only gone through a, a period of change over the last two and a half years, but now we have a completely new way that most people are working, that the hybrid component to things has changed dynamics quite substantially. So really understanding what that is like and providing the, the responses and the resolute, sorry, the solutions for that and external, but they don't necessarily need to go hand in hand. Awesome. I we need another session. There's more. There's more. I personally want to ask, and there's more um, questions from from the audience. But Joel, I will let you share how we can address that later. After, let's uh, close today's session with Rick starting with you know your your words. Maybe sum up how businesses can embrace these emerging new technologies and channels in communicating with their customers. Thanks, Jane. I think we could have another session on this. I, I think it comes down to um, it comes down to curiosity, which is um, sounds cheesy because of our company name, but um, everything is experimentation at this point, particularly with these new channels. So, you know, there's some some questions about complexity of programs and how you roll these out. There are lightweight ways to start and to learn and to improve. And I think that's the key way to get started on all of this is be willing to go and try things, find out what works for your customer, find out what adds business a value for your business. Um, be curious about it. It's, it's quite an exciting space to play in. Love it. Sam? Um, the other angle I'd love to add on top of that is like, um, you know, if a lot of like transformation leader or innovation leader, they think about, you know, whether it's technology or human or which part of the human task can be replaced by technology. But the reality is like, it's always, you know, we call it human plus AI, but it's human plus technology. Um, in the end, I think the starting point should be the value to end customers and what value you are trying to deliver and which part of the, you know, the whole puzzle you can't really deal with because of the limitation you are having today. That's where technology can potentially help. So, um, you know, from our perspective, this is just what we are trying to jump in and help. So, yeah. Fantastic. Adam, can't wait to hear your last words for today. Oh, no pressure. Um, I guess my recommendation to any business that I ever speak to is learn what it's like to be your own customer. Go through your own experiences at every stage of the journey. 
learn what frustrates you, learn what works, and you'll soon realize that how you are dealt with as your own customer is probably not how you would expect because we're all the same. We've all evolved in terms of how we expect conversations and messages and how we expect to interact with businesses. But not many people are investing in going through their own customer experience journey. You will learn a lot from doing that. And then you'll have a better understanding of really where you need to focus your time. It has been a delight just hearing all of your, you know, business and fun anecdotes and experiences and expertise, Rick, Sam, and Adam. Thank you so much. And I personally wish we, we can have a second session. Joel, maybe you can organize that. And now I give you back the floor. Yes, yes, most definitely. So once again, thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, most definitely. If there are any you know, opportunities to do another round of this discussion, I think we've received a lot of questions and I even you know wrote some of my notes on my own as well. So this has been really interesting. So once again, thank you so much to our to Jean, to our moderator and to all of our panelists, Adam, Sam, and Rick. So and of course this event would have been wouldn't have been possible without our friends from Curious Things. And it doesn't end here. So echoing what we have heard earlier, if you're interested to test and experience what Curious Thing has been brewing, you may scan the code on your screen or click on the link in the chat box to experience Curious Things voice AI.